When it comes to NFL content here on YouTube, draft grades are far from a new concept. There's plenty of people out there who will talk about their favorite drafts or their least favorite drafts. People that have a channel dedicated to a specific team will focus on that team's draft. There's guys out there like I did last year who will talk about the draft in its entirety, but break it down into eight videos going division by division. There's other people who will just make one video talking about the draft at large and be done with it. All of those are very valid and quite frankly, correct ways of going about this whole draft content thing. However, because I wanted to be different, back in the month of May, I decided that I was going to do one video for every single NFL team. 32 videos throughout the months of May and June talking about the draft and grading every single pick. Here we are at the end of August, and I still have two whole divisions left to do. So that didn't work out, and I found out very quickly why I had seen no one else do this. Now that being said, I made a commitment. I owe it to both myself and to you, the viewer, to complete this, to go through with these last eight teams, these last two divisions, and hand out my grades for the 2024 NFL Draft. Now that being said, because we are in late August, preseason has ended, cut day is either rapidly approaching or in the past by the time you're watching these videos, and we've seen camp and, you know, the development that these rookies are already undergoing, just know that that's not really factoring into these grades. Now, there have been a couple exceptions here and there. I make sure to disclose when those are, but for the most part, these grades were grades that I wrote down in, you know, early May and have stuck to. Now, that being said, if there's a grade that has already showing signs of aging poorly, then I will tell you, hey, this is how I felt about this player before the draft. However, it looks like he's already starting to prove me wrong. I will happily admit that, and we can all laugh at me taking forever and being a big, dumb, stupid idiot. Also with that, please try to keep in mind that I'm not trying to say that I am better or know better than any of the GMs that get mentioned in these videos. I'm just a 21-year-old college kid who spent what little free time he had during the spring, you know, taking a look at film and scouting prospects and doing what I could to the best of my ability. And I like sharing my opinions on this kind of stuff. You guys seem to like it when I share my opinion on this kind of stuff, so I'm going to continue to do it. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at the San Francisco 49ers and what they did during the 2024 NFL Draft. The San Francisco 49ers are always one of my favorite teams to watch during the offseason. I love watching them during the season, too. Like, you know, I'm a fullback guy. What they do with Kyle Juszczyk is unreal. I don't have to talk about that any more than I already have on this channel. Uh, I just wanted to get my Juszczyk mention. I got I to gotta get one per video when I'm talking about the Niners. Uh, but in all seriousness, like, this is an incredible football team, and they're able to maintain success because they do a great job of finding talent, whether that is, you know, guys on one year prove it deals. They bring in 15 defensive linemen. It feels like a year, five of them make the roster that weren't there last year. And, you know, four out of the five have four to five sacks. Like they know how to get production out of guys that you wouldn't expect production out of. And then they go on, get big money and, and they repeat the process. You know, we have Malik Collins this year who had a viral clip against the Raiders where he beat like three dudes on one play. Leonard Floyd, who's become an established journeyman, got a one-year deal. Then, you know, some of their later draft picks. Obviously, Brock Purdy, their starting quarterback, was Mr. Irrelevant. Uh, some other guys like Diamador Lenore, who's been really solid. Telenoa Hufanga wasn't a high draft pick. Jair Brown looked really good last year, despite being a quote-unquote head-scratcher pick. You know, they manage to find talent where they can, and they make the most of it. And I mentioned last year's draft, they didn't do so great at that, right? Last year was a draft that had a lot of people scratching their heads. I don't remember what grade I gave them exactly, but I think it was in the D range. Like, it was not a great draft. Then they come out this year, and they do what they did. You can see my grades here. They absolutely killed it. I love what they did. So you take this Niners team of last year that, you know, goes without saying. I don't have to read off the roster like I would for other teams. You add in a bunch of awesome draft picks. You get year two of some of the young guys that showed talent last year, like Jair Brown, who they're going to expect a lot of. Uh, year two of Jake Moody at kicker. 
some development stuff going on with guys like D Winners and Daryl Luter Jr. Like this is uh, the Niners. You know, this is a great team. And that all starts with the selection of Ricky Pearsall out of Florida, the wide receiver. And I think this pick is a great show of what their strategy is. And that is, if you know you're not going to be able to retain a player, if you know for a fact a player is going to leave, do everything in your power to replace them before they do. And when I say replace them, I don't mean get rid of them necessarily. I don't even mean get a player of equal talent. Just get somebody who can ju do the job they do. And Ricky Pearsall is a prime example of that with Brandon Ayuk. Now, I'm not saying the writing is on the wall with Ayuk. Anything can happen still. He's still on the roster. I figured he'd be traded by now if they were going to get rid of him. Maybe in the, you know, 20th hour or whatever, they find a way to, you know, get a contract extension done with him. Make sure he's locked down long term, which makes the Pearsall pick even better, if you ask me. Uh, but we'll talk about that. Pearsall is just such an exciting player, and he does a lot of the things that Ayuk does. Is he as good as Ayuk? No, he's a rookie. No one's expecting him to be a borderline top 10 receiver as a rookie. But he's pretty freaking good. And in terms of the route running and just being really quarterback friendly, knowing how to get open, knowing how to come back to the ball, just being super creative, Pearsall can do all of that. He is a great weapon that is just super quarterback friendly. He's a legit separator. He's got the speed. He's got the route running, like I said. Really consistent hands. He can win at the catch point. He can run block. Maybe not to the same extent as Ayuk, but Ayuk was basically forced against his will to become one of the best run blocking receivers in football. Maybe Pearsall gets the same treatment. Um, but this is an incredible pick for the now, where he's going to be, on paper, your fourth receiver, but I would imagine he's probably going to get more reps than that as another receiver in this room that can be an actual separator. You know, they only have one in Ayuk. Debo's not a separator. Uh, you know, Juwan Jennings is not that type of player. He's more of a wing tight end than he is a, a receiver, if we're being honest, which is fine. That's not a shot at Juwan Jennings. I love what he does. You know, Ronnie Bell, Danny Gray, those are guys that can separate, but they're not separators, if that makes sense. You know, they're not guys that are going to consistently get separation and consistently be open they're just fast, right? They're not beating guys with footwork or fancy route running. They're just fast. They might outrun you on a crossing route or a slant. But, you know, when it comes to running these more intricate routes, uh, having an expansive route tree, Ayuk's the only guy on the roster that has that. So you add in Ricky Pearsall, you got two guys like that. If Ayuk leaves, Pearsall's your replacement to be your number one receiver alongside Debo and these other guys. And that's awesome. You get that in the first round. You know, I had... 25, 35 receivers, goodness, not 25, 35 receivers on my board. Pearsall was ranked ninth, but when you consider how deep this receiver class was, I think that's pretty solid. Most of the receivers I had ahead of him were gone by the time he was drafted, and that gives you any indication. In fact, the only guy I had over him was Keon Coleman. He was the only one that, or no, I'm sorry, Keon Coleman and Lad McConkey. Ladd ended up falling. I was shocked by that. And Keon Coleman went right around the same area. So, you know, this is one of those things where like there were guys I like better, but the fit, they did they don't fit what Pearsall is as well. Ladd McConkey's more of like uh, less of this true like X that Ayuk is and more of like a Z, more of like a Deontay Johnson kind of that type of player. Whereas Keon Coleman's not a separator. He's just a big body receiver. I, I likened him to Brandon Marshall with my draft comps. That type of player where he's not going to separate, but he can run routes well enough. He's got enough speed. He's got enough this. He's got enough that. He's going to be really dominant at the catch point. Ricky Pearsall is the same type of player as Brandon Ayuk. Now, is he Brandon Ayuk? Not yet. I think he absolutely can be. But, you know, just running through my notes here, he explodes in and out of his breaks. He's able to swiftly throttle up and down on routes. He has great long speed to stretch the field and threaten vertically. He's able to cook at all three levels with his fluid, nuanced route running, as well as his pacing and deceptive movements within his routes. His speed and acceleration pair with technique and nuance to make him an explosive route runner who consistently makes defenses pay for giving him free releases. His flexible hips allow him to pinch acute angles while maintaining speed. 
He has incredibly reliable hands with a career drop rate of 3.6% and only three total drops in his last two years of college football. He's physical at the catch point with elite hand strength to elevate and reel in 50-50 balls, had a career contested catch rate of 45.2%. You want to get near that 50% mark, that's pretty damn good. Uh, he possesses the ability to identify and attack soft spots against the zone quickly. He has some juice and a little bit of strength after the catch. He's going to be another one of these rack guys that the Niners love. And he's a willing blocker who understands his assignments, even if he struggles to keep with them from time to time. That's not going to last long. Shanahan's going to love the fact that he wants to block and then he knows how to block. He's just going to teach him the ways to be a little bit more physical with it, right? If Shanahan is anything, he's somebody who wants everybody blocking on the field. Now, that being said, he's going to be 24 at the start of the season. You know, not great. Uh, he typically goes down at first contact, but I think that's something he will definitely work on. He has a smaller frame and he's a little bit slender, but I'm not worried about that whatsoever. I think he's going to be an incredible player at the NFL level. I think at worst, you know, if I, well, at worst, and then saying if I stays, don't really go together. But at worst for Pearsall, if Ayuk stays around, you know, you extend Ayuk, he's going to be one hell of a slot, right? One hell of a third receiver. At best, for Pearsall's sake, if Ayuk does leave, I think he can step into that role and sooner rather than later take over, be the true alpha in this receiver room, which would be great, ushering in a little bit of youth, uh, even though he is already, or he's going to be 24 here very soon. Either way, very, very good player. Love that pick. Then we go into the second round, and they took another player I really liked in Renardo Green, the corner out of Florida State. I watched 15 corners this year. He was my CB7, had a mid-second round grade on him. You take him here with the last pick in the second round. So first of all, the value is great. Second of all, perfect player for your defense. This is another really good press man corner. Reminds me personally a lot of Legereus Sneed, which is super high praise. You know, one of the best press man corners in the sport is probably between him and Charvarius Ward, ironically currently of the 49ers. This is somebody that can play inside. He can play outside. You know, he's 5'11", 186 pounds, but he plays like he's six foot three. His physicality is unreal. He loves to hit people really, really good against the run. According to ESPN's depth chart for the 49ers, he looks to be playing out of the nickel. If that's the case, that's great because he isn't the fastest guy in the world. But, you know, he has ways that he makes up for that with his physicality and his awareness and just, you know, really good ball skills, knowing where the ball's at and how to attack it, things like that. Uh, one part of his game that I really, really liked at Florida State is he's really good at playing to the sideline good at making sure you know he's aware of where the sideline is and using that to his advantage because as a corner if you can kind of push a receiver to the sideline or lead a receiver to the sideline it's a lot harder for them to make a catch because they got to keep their feet in bounds uh so he's really really good at knowing where that sideline is and kind of manipulating it his quick feet loose hips he's able to flip and run pretty pretty easily in man coverage he's just an awesome physical press man corner exactly what the Niners need uh, a cornerback room of him and Diamador Lenore and Traverius Ward as I just said with guys like Samuel Womack and Ambry Thomas that's exciting like that's a really really exciting secondary um you know that's just the corners we'll talk about the safeties here when we get to the fourth round uh, but I, I love what they're building I think this is a great pick great value you know, just back-to-back, -back perfect A-plus picks. Couldn't have done it any better myself. Then we get into the third round, and they take Dominic Pooney, the offensive lineman out of Kansas. Somebody I was a little bit lower on than their other two picks, but it was still a good pick. You're, you're taking a lineman who has that inside-outside versatility. 6'4", 323 pounds, uh, really, really strong hands. Is a light lower half that allows him to you know, kind of keep up with quicker edge rushers or quicker defensive linemen. He's very crafty. He's very smart. Keeps his head on a swivel. His really good latch and mirror ability with his grip strength and quick feet. He's somebody that played inside, could probably kick outside if you need him to. I would imagine the Niners probably want to keep him on the inside because the inside of their offensive line is not fantastic. Uh, but we shall see what the plan is there. Uh, plus it's probably best to keep him inside because he's not somebody who has a lot of range. You know, he's not somebody who's going to jump out of his kick sets and, you know, be able to get up to the second level super, super quickly. Just not the most athletic guy in the world. But if you want somebody who's a borderline immovable object, that's Poonie. 
right? He's a good developmental offensive lineman. Not somebody you're going to want to start day one, but definitely somebody you can get excited about. Definitely somebody you can look at and say, okay, this is the future at guard, right? I, I think that is very, very apparent. I'm excited to see what they're going to do with him. Again, you could probably play him a tackle if you wanted to. I wouldn't recommend it, but they're the experts, right? And, and God knows they need any help where they can get it on the offensive line. As we move into day three, they had four fourth round picks and they absolutely knocked the first two out of the park, starting with Malik Mustafa, the safety out of Wake Forest. I thought this was the best safety in the class. I had a second round grade on him. Wasn't a fantastic safety class, but I loved Mustafa's tape. There is a lot of uh, Talanoa Hufanga in his tape, to be quite frank. I, I love, loved what I saw. Very explosive great route anticipation he's able to squeeze down on routes very very quickly if he's aligned deeper in the play uh, he's very quick to key in on the run and explodes to the ball and run defense loves to get down and dirty in the box has the frame to do so uh, he's somebody that has good speed and good range to play that deep safety role if needed his play strength rivals a lot of the linebackers in this class Granted, you know, linebackers aren't quite what they used to be in terms of being big and bulky, but that doesn't matter. Like, Mustafa is stronger probably than a lot of the linebackers in this class. He's an excellent blitzer. Has, um, He's played all over the defense. He played free safety, split safety, strong safety, dime linebacker, slot corner, and even a little bit of on-ball linebacker and, or a little bit of off-ball linebacker and a little bit of edge. Like, he played everywhere. This is a super versatile player. Team captain at Wake Forest, outspoken leader from what I was able to pull together. Just an awesome safety, like exactly what you want in a Talanoa Hufanga fill-in to start with, because obviously he's recovering from that major leg injury he suffered last year. But hey, you know, at the end of the day, what's better than one Talanoa Hufanga? Try two, maybe three with Jai or Brown. Like he's very, very similar as well. You've got these three safeties that can all do a little bit of everything. Mustafa, probably the strongest and best like downhill out of the group, but he can certainly hold his own over the top. You know, he misses some tackles here and there. He's not somebody that's going to play over the top the full game. He, he's a little over aggressive at times, but hey, you know, it, all of these could have been said about Hufanga and Brown coming out. Look where they're at now, right? I think the Niners coaching staff knows how to coach these guys up, how to mold them the way they want to be molded. So I think that's great. I think he's somebody that's going to be an instant impact starter. And when Talanoa Hufanga's contract comes calling here sooner rather than later, maybe you don't have to pay him because you have Malik Mustafa. Now, obviously, you want to keep as many guys as you can, but I think Mustafa is somebody that makes that decision a little bit more difficult, uh, which... You know, for better or worse, but I, I love Mustafa. I think this is an awesome pick. Like I said, the best safety in the class. You get him here in the fourth round. Plenty of safeties went before him. Perfect fit. Great player. Just a really, really good pick. And then just five picks later, they end up taking Isaac Garendo, the running back out of Louisville. This probably isn't the first time you've heard this comparison. It won't be the last. He's Raheem Mostert, dude. Like two a T. You know, he's got elite long speed, really solid frame. He's able to quickly identify and attack cutback lanes when in outside zone situations with the Niners running a decent bit of zone. Does a good job taking care of the football. He's a solid stiff arm. He's hard to bring down once he gets going. He's able to explode through arm tackles. He was a decent receiver with solid production in college. Uh, low usage numbers in college means he has plenty of tread still left on the tires. He was a good kick returner as evidenced by his big kick return in the preseason. Uh, now he's doesn't have the best vision running between the tackles he has a notable injury history and through five seasons in college he wasn't the most productive player but quite frankly I think you can live with that right you're not asking Garendo to come in to be your your number one running back you look at this running back room McCaffrey's the alpha you've got Elijah Mitchell as like your change of pace RB2 you've got Jordan Mason is just another name in there um, and then you've got Garendo as kind of your more explosive player to come in in like the third quarter when the defense is worn down a little bit. McCaffrey wants a breather and he can just explode on a toss player on outside zone or whatever. 
The only thing I want to mention here is this pick and Pooney together are very interesting because these are two players that kind of flash in terms of their best projected role and their best projected scheme. Because we know Shanahan is Shanahan offense, very zone heavy. It's a wide zone team. But as of late, they've been dialing a little bit more into power, you know, uh, running counter and trap and, and just focusing on more man up blocking. And that's what Dominic Pooney fits. I should have mentioned that earlier, but like that is where he's going to be at his best. And then you've got Garendo, who is more of a zone runner, right? He's not great between the tackles, but running outside zone, uh, the, this zone rushing scheme that the Niners are known for, that's what he's going to fit best into with his skill set. Now, it's, I'm not saying the Niners have an identity crisis. I'm just saying it's an interesting observation, one I wanted to make. Um, I trust Shanahan with my life when it comes to figuring out this kind of stuff, so I'm not, like, worried about it. It's just interesting. It's just an observation. Uh, I'm, I'm mainly trying to fill out this section with Garendo a little bit more, just because... You know, I could just say fast running back good Shanahan took his yearly fourth round running back and he took a good one and call it a day. But, you know, that there's, where's the fun in that, right? You want to add a little something, something there. Uh, so I think that's a really good pick. And then their final fourth round pick, six picks later, they took Jacob Cowing, the wide receiver out of Arizona. I like this pick. I think my only complaint is maybe there were some receivers I would have taken over him. But that being said, he's a good slot receiver. He's got good bursts and acceleration off the line of scrimmage. He's got that home run speed. He's able to threaten with it on all routes on the vertical plane and as a ball carrier. His hips are like very rubber band like in terms of fluidity. He's able to drop his weight and explode effortlessly to create separation consistently. He's able to locate and attack soft spots against zone coverage. He's a really effective release package with sudden and controlled footwork. He's really crafty on deeper routes um, he's able to vary his tempo and he has flashes of excellence when it comes to his iq at the top of his route there were flashes of really effective short route running uh, with ample separation on slant speed outs and like zig routes he was able to lead defenders into blockers when he had the ball in his hands and he's willing to stick it to bigger defenders and give ideal effort with blocking assignments even though he's not the biggest guy in the world so what's this tell you? Crafty player, can do a little bit of everything, good with the ball in his hands, high effort, likes to block. That's a Shanahan receiver if I've ever seen one. In fact, I'm looking at this grade right now in uh, during recording. I have it as an A, I'm upping it to an A+. Like this is a Shanahan receiver through and through. I can sit here and nitpick and be like, yeah, there are receivers I like better. As I'm saying it out loud, this is a Shanahan receiver, dude. This is somebody that Kyle is absolutely going to find fun things to do with. He's somebody that's going to see the field and have some big gadget plays. Now, you know, he has the, the usual small receiver issues. Frame small. He's probably only going to be able to play out of the slot. Doesn't have a great catch radius, blah, blah, blah. It's whatever. Drops are something to keep an eye on, though. 33 drops over five seasons is far from ideal. You want to work on that. But I think you can teach that concentration and then his limited play strength could lower his ceiling as a threat after the catch, but I think he's smart enough, evasive enough, elusive enough, quick enough, whatever word you want to use to make up for that strength deficiency. So I really like that pick. Like I said, I have an, I have an A in, in, in during my recording. I'm upping that to an A plus in post. That is an incredible pick. And then we get to the sixth round and they double dip on the offensive line, this time taking Jarrett Kingston, the interior lineman out of USC. You know, a, a good depth, right? He's a good athlete. He's able to get to his landmarks quickly as a move blocker. He has a really good targeting system that allows him to find the right guy at the second level or when in space. He has excellent latch and mirror ability with strong arms, 32 bench reps at the combine and quick feet. He has plenty of tackle and guard flexibility in spite of having shorter arms. Uh, he has four years of starting experience all across the offensive line. However, play strength isn't great. Arm length is below average, and he declared as a six-year senior, so he's a little bit on the older side. This is a good pick uh, in terms of depth. I will say, you know, as a Bears fan who's watched a lot of Caleb Williams tape, he was the one guy where you're taking a look at that offensive line and you're like, 
Okay, he was doing his job sometimes, and that's a lot more than I can say for the other four guys up front. So I, I thought that was a solid pick. You know, you're in the sixth round, you're looking for somebody that may or may not make the roster as some solid depth. I think that's perfectly fine work. I like what they did there. And then Tatum Bethune, linebacker out of Florida State. I've never watched this dude play football. I don't know if he's good or not. Uh, but what I can tell you is linebacker going to San Francisco. We know how that ends. Uh, if he ends up developing, great. If not, it is what it is. Seventh round. Uh, but, you know, I I'm, I'm sure they see something in him. I'm sure there's a reason they took him in the seventh round. I'm not going to give that pick a grade because, like I said, I've never consciously, like, went out of my way to watch the guy play football. I'm, I've seen him in passing, watching other players. Obviously, when I was watching Renardo Green, he would have been on the field. But I wasn't dialed in. I wasn't locked in. I don't know what he was doing. I wasn't paying attention to him. So maybe there's something there. Maybe not. Seventh round. Who cares? As a whole, the Niners knocked it out of the park, especially after switching that Jacob Cowan grade to an A-plus mid-recording. It's not apparent this is an A-plus draft. This is about as perfect as you can get. Dominic Pooney is going to be interesting to watch develop. Uh, and then Jarrett Kingston is whatever as offensive line depth. But outside of that, I mean, Pearsall, Green, Mustafa, Gerendo, and Cowing, all perfect picks, all guys that fit exactly what they need, what they're looking for. It just doesn't get any better than this. And honestly, after the draft the Niners had last year, I am really glad to see them step it up this year and go to town. Because this is... This is one of the best draft classes in the league. Um, might be a little bit biased. I would say it's either second or third behind Chicago and like maybe Philadelphia. I'd have to really think on it. When I get to the end of the series, I will drop a ranking of all 32 draft classes. Probably won't be its own video. It'll probably just be at the end of whatever team is last in the series. Uh, whatever AFC West team I decide to save for last. Probably Kansas City. That'll probably be fitting, right? They won the Super Bowl. Sorry, Niners fans, to bring that back up. You check out a good game in the Super Bowl, though, and that's all that matters. Uh, but that being said, this is a hell of a draft to have the year after being in the Super Bowl to turn around and say, hey, listen, we lost last year. We're not going to let it happen again. We're all going all the way this year. Uh, and I think you got some guys that can be serious contributors on a Super Bowl team this year if that's what ends up being in the cards for the 49ers. Met a chance on the throwback. This, a, was, this was an ill-advised throw. What an unbelievable catch by Cole Komet. And he and he cups it too. No movement when he hits the ground, tucked up against his shoulder. Wow. Using that.